produced an extraordinary wave. If the Cumbria Basha were to collapse as one civil block, it would create a giant mega tsunami with an initial wave height of 650 meters and a wave length of 30 to 40 kilometers, traveling westwards across the Atlantic with speeds up to 720 kilometers an hour towards America. I mean, that's a good point of stop. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're onto something really major, you have to switch on blue light in your laboratory. Okay, so uh, we've have to now uh, move back to thermals. <laughs> but I'm sure we can see if we have used thermals. Maybe he has. In fact, they are quite common in geostatistics, maybe Neil will know more about this, about creaching and methods like this. So the, the, the geostatisticians have actually invented a variant of Gaussian process models uh, well before the machine learning people and probably also before other statisticians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course Gaussian processes in turn are very or are kernel methods and they are related to support vector machines that I will tell you something about. Uh, today, or probably tomorrow. Uh, today I just want to tell you a bit more about kernels and maybe about uh, kernel PCA. Let's see. And uh, so let's first start with this one. I think there was a question related to this before here. Um, so uh, remember the picture map that we had before? Um, if we represent a point by a kernel function centered on that point, uh, if we think of the kernel function as a similarity measure, it gives us the similarity between the two arguments that we plug into the kernel here. Now, if we represent one point by a kernel function, uh, evaluated at that one point, the second argument open, it basically means we represent this point uh, in terms of its similarities to all other possible points. So it's actually an interesting way to think of an object as Maybe if you're only uh, if you're only ever going to look at an object through the similarity function, which in a sense is the philosophy of kernel methods, then of course there is nothing else to that object other than its similarity to anything else that's possible, and that's exactly this representation here. So that's the similarity between X and anything else you might want to compare it with. So. Uh, that's a nice representation, and we've shown we can construct those products in that representation, uh, with this nice uh, property that corresponds to the kernel function evaluated directly on pairless points. Um, but of course, uh, it begs the question of what, how about if we uh, want to represent it by its similarity to all other points, but instead just to a sample of points, uh, like uh, this gentleman here. So while you think about this, I just remember there's a lady in the background who has this uh, Nikon camera, it's not to give away, but she forgot her charger. So if someone has a similar camera, it doesn't have to be pink, but it has to be Nikon or Nikon, and uh, it should have a charger, uh, well, a similar kind of charger. Yeah, or, the USB cable that or, or a USB cable. Yeah, but for Nikon. I have a USB cable. Well, I'm sure there must be someone who has a similar camera here. Hey, you are two people on video lectures. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the things that people doesn't work yet on video lectures. Is it a Coolpix camera? It's a Coolpix camera, 14 megapixels. But I think most of these Nikons are Coolpix. Coolpix S3100, 3100. Okay, so please, uh, if you have something similar or even the same, uh, just tell her. Okay, so now uh, if, if we represent the uh, kernel by its similarity, uh, this object by its similarity to just a sample of points, um, so the first idea would be we could say, well, let's represent it like this. This is a vector, it's sort of an approximation to this function, and now we have to define a dot product uh, for this kind of vectors, and the dot product, of course, should again satisfy our kernel property. So the dot product should be such that if we take the dot product between this thing here and the same thing for x prime, we want to recover k of x comma x prime. 
Uh, maybe this is asking too much uh, if we ask it for general x, x prime, but maybe if, if this, uh, maybe if the point that we substitute in here is actually one of the training points, maybe then we can do it and the answer is yes, we can. And uh, it's not surprising in principle. And the way to do it, so first of all, if we just did what I just showed you, if we just use this definition and then use the canonical sort product between vectors of this form, do you have an idea what we would get in that case for the kernel matrix? So we would actually get the square of the kernel matrix because, uh, I mean, normally the kernel matrix is formed by taking dot product of vectors of five, and two five combined to one kernel, but now here every vector already has the kernel in a sense, so we have the kernel twice. Uh, so we would get uh, a gram matrix, uh, which is the square of the original kernel matrix. Uh, but that tells us already how to fix things. And that's the easy way to fix it. We just have to define this mapping or define the dot product uh, equivalently. So we can either move this modification into the dot product or into the mapping. Uh, but uh, if the kernel is not strictly positive, definitely it's better to use it into the, move it into the mapping. Um, so we move k to the minus one half into the mapping. So here we are, uh, well actually no, I, sh I should say, I should always assume it's strictly positive definite or maybe add a little epsilon. Let's assume it's strictly positive definite so we can compute k to the minus one half. And um, in that case, if we take the dot product between two such things, uh, two of these k to the minus one halves will combine to the k to the minus one and together with the k squared, in the end we will be left just with k. So it will satisfy uh, this property here uh, for all training points. It will, for other points, it will just have an approximation. Okay, so that's one way to think of the finite dimensional approximation. And here's uh, another thing about uh, the finite case. So what, what if we have only a discrete set of training points and someone gives us uh, just the kernel matrix, not the analytic form of the kernel. Can we still construct a kernel mapping for these training points? Or in a sense, if uh, maybe the domain is discrete, so the domain only has n points, then of course there's no difference between a mapping defined on these n points and a mapping defined everywhere because these points are everywhere, everything that is. So what if we only have a discrete kernel matrix? Uh, how do we uh, get a feature map from that? I think there's different ways, and that's an, an easy problem of linear algebra. One such way to, would be to simply diagonalize the kernel matrix. So diagonal, it can be diagonalized, the kernel matrix, and the eigenvalues will be non-negative. So we will get uh, a factorization of this form, where S is an orthogonal matrix, D is a diagonal matrix with non-negative entries on the diagonal. Uh, we can then write any element of the kernel matrix like this. We can, uh, which we can in turn write as a dot product between these two objects. These are the rows of the matrix S. And we can then uh, split this uh, D, it's a symmetric matrix. So first of all, we split it into square root D times square root D. Square root D, of course, is still symmetric is D, uh, if D is a diagonal matrix. So we can move one of the square root Ds onto the other side as a dot product. So we can do that for symmetric matrices. Um, to get this thing here, and of course this thing here, you can think, simply think of as, so this is the image of the point xi under the feature map, and this is the image of the point xj under the feature map. So this is a, a map into a finite dimensional feature space, a map from a discrete set to a finite dimensional feature space, uh, which gives us the kernel matrix. So some things are um, nicer to think of in a finite dimensional setting, Actually, if you are interested in the finite dimension case, there's also, we once wrote a paper about doing everything for the finite dimension case, uh, not just positive definite kernels, but also conditionally positive definite kernels, and a number of things related to that, and a lot of things uh, turn out to be much easier for that. So I think it's on the web. The first author is uh, Steinke. <coughs> okay, there's another uh, interesting thing that one can do with kernel matrices, which hasn't, maybe hasn't been used enough yet, has been applied uh, sometimes, but not much, uh, which is functional calculus. Uh, the beautiful uh, thing from functional, analy uh, functional analysis, uh, 
Um, it's something you can do uh, for any symmetric uh, uh, matrices. You can even do it for symmetric operators. Um, so let's assume K is such a kernel matrix. Um, K has a certain spectrum. In our case, the spectrum is non-negative, so the spectrum is a set of eigenvalues. Um, if we have some function, some continuous function defined on the spectrum, then we can also define functions of the matrix K, of our kernel matrix, and it will turn out then these uh, functions will have a spectrum that looks like this. So the, all the eigenvalues will simply be the same function applied to our original eigenvalues. And, so, and there are different ways of computing uh, this function of a matrix. You can either do it uh, via Taylor series, or maybe simpler, you can do it via eigenvalue decomposition. You just diagonalize the kernel matrix. Uh, D is diagonal, S is again orthogonal or unitary matrix. And then uh, it turns out the function applied uh, to the kernel, which you would get by a Taylor series, can more easily be computed by simply applying the function to the diagonal elements uh, of this uh, matrix D. And then we can do uh, a lot of things. We can basically treat functions of symmetric matrices like functions on R, or in terms of mathematics, um, there's an isomorphism between uh, uh, a certain algebra generated by the symmetric matrix K and the algebra of uh, continuous functions on the spectrum of K. So that's just, uh, I want, wanted to make sure you've seen that. Um, maybe one day we would want to do some non-trivial operations on, on kernel matrices. So here's another uh, thing about uh, kernel matrices and positive definite kernels, which you might be interested in. Um, this is uh, something about conditionally positive definite kernels. So I cannot really deal with them in detail, but I want you to at least, I want to make sure you have heard about conditionally positive definite kernels uh, in this course. And one uh, motivation for conditionally positive definite kernels is that uh, positive definite kernels now correspond to dot products in other spaces, um, but often uh, algorithms really only depend on distances, not on dot products. So why do I say only in distances? I think maybe, maybe Neil has already covered some of this. Um, I think he has. So I'm saying only on distances because that's something weaker in a sense because every uh, product gives you a distance but not vice versa. So uh, uh, effectively, if you want to get from a distance to a dot product, you have to fix an origin. If you, just, if you have a method that only depends on distances, then this method is translationary, uh, translation invariant. You move your data, it doesn't matter for the method. But of course, for a dot product method, uh, moving the data does matter, unless the method has some kind of centering built in. So uh, it turns out that many kernel methods do have centering built in. And as a consequence, many kernel methods actually need something slightly weaker than a kernel that corresponds to a dot product. They just need something like a kernel that corresponds to a distance. And this kernel has, turns out to be a uh, conditionally positive. So, so here I have written it a bit differently, but maybe I should also tell you here. So basically, if K is a positive definite kernel, then of course, now we've shown that there's a map uh, that uh, corresponds to this kernel or that such that the dot product after this map is equal to the kernel. We can then also use that map to compute a distance, of course, because this distance between these two elements in the feature space is just the dot product of this vector with itself. And if we compute this dot product, then of course we can do that in terms of kernels. We get this quantity with itself as the first term, this with itself as this term, and then we have two mixed terms with a minus sign. So given a positive definite kernel, we can also compute distances in a feature space. And then given the dot product, of course, we can compute distances, we can compute angles and all sorts of things. Um, and this is then uh, the Hilbert space representation uh, as a distance. And it turns out this kind of representation works for a slightly larger class of kernels, which are called conditionally positive definite. And uh, so it turns out uh, uh, all algorithms that are translationally invariant, uh, such as kernel PTA or, uh, or SVMs, can actually be also be done with conditionally positive definite kernels. And uh, there are some examples of kernels that are conditionally positive definite, but not positive definite. So one example, for instance, is well, just an approximate example. Uh, in the early days of support vector machines, people were quite interested in this kernel, which was the hyperbolic tangent of 
got product between x and x prime plus um, c. And uh, this is actually not a positive definite kernel. If you compute a uh, kernel matrix with this and you look at the eigenvalues, you will typically find a negative eigenvalue. And people were quite bothered with that, but they like that kernel because it looks like the excavation function of a neural network. So uh, in those days, it was still, I mean, the, when, when, when we wrote all those papers about super packet machines, the reviewers would ask us to compare against their own networks. And then at some point, maybe six or seven years later, uh, they would ask everybody to compare their methods against the source network. And uh, now, I don't know, maybe the way to swing back against the neural networks, so maybe we have a, a, a merry a mixture, a postmodern, of all sorts of methods. Anyway, so this uh, thing was a bit funny, but I remember I, I at some point, at that point I was a student, I looked at the values for which this actually worked. It didn't work for all uh, values of C. If I remember correctly, so the hyperbolic tangent is uh, you know, something like this. Uh, for me, it only worked if I had uh, a negative C, which means shifting this curve to the right. So I actually have the curve a bit like that. And, and if I looked at how it best worked, it also I had to make sure the data is normalized in a certain range. And then at some point I noticed that the range I was operating with looked suspiciously like a polynomial kernel that I would sometimes use just shifted a little bit. Now it turns out if you take a, if k is a positive definite kernel, then actually k uh, plus uh, c, where c could also be a negative number, is always at least conditionally positive definite. So therefore, the, even though the hyperbolic tangent is not positive definite, uh, it can be well approximated in a certain range, and maybe the range where the data are lived in, in our experiments by a conditionally positive definite kernel, and that's why it, it works also with support packet machines. But then it was forgotten, and uh, people didn't worry about neural networks anymore until recently. <laughs> and they returned, yeah. So um, this is an example of a, a, a non-trivial kernel that we were playing around with at the time. Uh, we were interested in handwritten digit recognition mostly, it was mostly about images, so very simple images. Uh, and so for instance, we have these kernels that we found worked a bit better than standard polynomial kernels uh, that we call pyramid kernels. Uh, and now uh, in computer vision, people are using uh, the standard kernel that works best on uh, certain type of case. The problem is a pyramid, call it a pyramid match kernel. I think it's not exactly the same thing as this, but it's sort of a similar idea. Um, but I think it's they have reinvented it and maybe it's probably it's better or different. But this is uh, one of the ideas here was to um, compute a kernel which does not uh, compute all products of uh, input coordinates, but only uh, products uh, within a certain uh, locality. So uh, you have a polynomial kernel of a certain degree uh, D1 uh, in here. So we, you compute all products of all the D1 within here. But then you sum up all these local things and uh, you have another, uh, uh, you raise it to the power of D2 and if you can work it out, uh, uh, basically it means that we uh, compute overall polynomial kernel of degree D1 times D2, uh, but the really high degree uh, you don't get for arbitrary combinations, but only locally. So you have some sort of long range, long range nonlinearity or connection via this D2. And, and you have something which is only constrained locally at the D1. So that's one example of uh, uh, kernels uh, that are a little bit less trivial. And maybe I will show more examples uh, later. So uh, now I want to show you uh, the simplest possible uh, kernel algorithm uh, one could possibly probably think of. And um, this is an algorithm that I thought of when I was working on a book about kernels. And uh, it was just for uh, pedagogical uh, reasons. So I thought, let's just try to the simplest possible thing. And actually, surprisingly, it turns out that we only noticed that maybe five years later that it's, uh, it's quite an interesting algorithm. It's quite, quite useful uh, in, in, in many ways. So I, I will probably say a bit about that as well. But let's first see the algorithm. So the algorithm is for pattern recognition, so a binary classification. And uh, the idea is we have 
two data sets, uh, positive and negative points. So let's say the negative ones are these circles and the positive ones are the pluses. And now we have a new point coming, let's call it X. We want to classify that new point X. And uh, we will simply say we will compute the mean of all uh, positive points. Um, this should actually be then called C plus. And the mean of all negative points, call it C minus. So this is the mean of the positive points. Uh, this is the number of positive points. So it's a sum over all points with label plus one. This is the same for the negative points. So given a new point, we will simply check, is it closer to the mean of the positive points or closer to the mean of the negative points? And uh, of course, one can do this in some returns because uh, of course we want to do this in the feature space. Otherwise, it's boring. It's gonna be a, if we do this in input space, it will be a very trivial algorithm. So we want to do it in the feature space. And we know how to compute work products in the feature space. So we know how to do geometry. We know how to do compute distances, angles, and so on. And uh, one way to uh, run great, well, the way we first uh, uh, kernelized this was simply by saying, let's take this vector w. Uh, this is easy to compute. We just take the difference of these two things. Um, and let's take this vector here, which we get as follows. We compute first the average of these two. It gives us this point c. And then we have our test point x, so we compute the difference vector of the two. Now the question is, uh, what is the angle between this vector and this, uh, more specifically, uh, what is the cosine of the angle, or even less, uh, is the cosine of the angle positive or negative? So if the cosine of the angle between this and this is positive, then the angle is between minus 90 and plus 90 degrees, which means we are on this side of the hyperplane. If the cosine is negative, we are on this side. How do we compute the cosine? We compute the product. So up to a scaling factor, the dot product is the cosine. So we simply compute the dot product between this vector and this vector, uh, and then look at whether this dot product is positive or negative. Okay, so let's do that. And uh, this is also something that I have sometimes asked people to do as an exercise. Maybe let's not do it now because we only have uh, 15 minutes left. But if you want to uh, play around with kernels and see how to kernelize an algorithm, maybe you can try it tonight. It's probably only going to take five, five minutes. So what you need to do is simply to uh, write down this vector w, the difference of these two, write down this vector x minus c. So you compute the mean of these two, x minus the mean of these two, so you have two somewhat complicated looking vectors. Each of them is like a big sum over some things. And then you write down the dot product of these two. You have the dot product, you use linearity. So in the end, uh, you try to sort of always combine an elementary phi with another elementary phi. You know how to uh, rewrite this in terms of kernels. And in the end, what you get is something that only depends on kernels. So we can do the calculations and it looks like this. So this is our dot product uh, rewritten in terms of kernels. And we have a, um, a set of kernel functions centered on all positive points. And divided by the number of positive points, we have a set of kernel functions centered on all negative points. Divided by the number of negative points, and we have an offset here, which is a constant, so it doesn't depend on the test point x. Uh, so let's, let's ignore this constant. Um, and give you an interpretation of what's left. So what is left is, so let's assume a special case that uh, we have a kernel which is a Gaussian that's normalized. So a Gaussian that has integral one. So it's a valid density model. Uh, if this is the case, then uh, here, uh, this thing is still normalized because this sums over a number of Gaussians, which is M plus, we divide by M plus. So this is a density model, and actually it's a, it's a simple, it's a well-known density model. It's simply called Pausen Windows a Density Estimate of the Positive Class. This is a Pausen Windows den Density Estimate of the Negative Class. And uh, overall, this gives you a classification rule, which is one of the simplest possible classifi classification rules. It's basically, you just estimate the densities of the two classes, and you just check whether uh, the density is higher for your test point uh, under the one model or under the other model. So that's one possible way, way of classifying data. And uh, so that's nothing uh, 
no deep method for that in the data, but if you were swimming to so notice this, it was somewhat surprising that uh, this turns out to be such a nice, simple uh, geometric rule. So it's just uh, a, a, a nearest mean uh, classifier, if you want, um, in the feature space. And, uh, and also one should say, of course, uh, this construction also works for other types of terms. They don't have to be normalized. Uh, they don't even have to be positive. So a Gaussian, of course, is not just a positive definite function, but it's also positive everywhere. The values that you get out are always positive, but if you take a polynomial term, you can also get negative values. So a positive definite function doesn't have to be positive everywhere. Yeah, right? we, we proved that it's positive on the diagonal, but of course, off-diagonal elements for a polynomial term can be negative. For the Gaussian, they can't be. But anyway, so this is something that, from that point of view, more general than Parson windows, but then from another point of view, it's less general because Parson windows, you can also use window functions that are not positive definite kernels, but uh, as long as they're positive and normalized or non-negative and normalized. Okay. So, um, so SVMs, I was actually thinking of not going into, let me see, should I go into great detail on that? So let me first just give you the a brief idea of SVMs, and then maybe tomorrow I'll tell you more about SVMs. <coughs> oh yeah, this is the map. So uh, the path. I'm not. I'm not sure I remember correctly, but this is the. So this is the old volcano. Uh, no, th sorry. This is a new one. This is the. That's the old one. No, no, I think this is the Cumbre Nueva, and this is the Cumbre Vieja. That, that's the old one, but that's the one that's still active, isn't it? Uh, the new one's in the south, the real one. Oh, no, or well maybe. Nueva, yeah. Here's a, here it says Vieja, that's the it's old. Above that, Nueva, but it's part of the real one. And here now. it says new, okay. The thing at the top, above the Nueva, is the old, that's the old. That's the old? Yeah, and then there's the new all the way down from the old. Whatever, yes, and which is the part that they were talking about in the film? Yeah, so uh, maybe, maybe someone fell off there. So, so well that fell off, I don't know. So I think they were talking <laughs> about that now. they were talking about the Cumbre Vieja, right? Yes. They said yeah. it differently. But uh, so I think they talk about this volcano here and this is the one that's still active. Yes. And there have been some eruptions. I think the most recent one was down here and the one in the fifties was probably somewhere here. Fernando is nodding and his wife is from the Canary Islands. So um, and I think actually some of this land is relatively new. And um, my recollection is that they, they are worried that half of this thing here will slide into this ocean and then a big wave will start from here and move into this direction. It might also move into other directions, but for, discovery <laughs> <laughs> think for, for the Discovery Channel, it's important that it moves in this direction. <laughs> Brazil is much closer, of course, but then nobody worries about the people in Brazil there. <laughs> if, if New York is in this direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one shouldn't be joking about this, yeah. Um, so, so this is, uh, this is the very short, uh, very short summary of what SVMs do, and I'm not sure, maybe we'll talk, we'll talk about it in more detail tomorrow. So now you've seen this, this mean classifier, uh, we, can, we can do something slightly more clever. So we can stick with uh, using a hyperplane in a uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is what the mean classifier was doing. We can take a better hyperplane because uh, we've uh, heard something about capacity, uh, complexity, heat dimension, and so on. So what if we could, if we could take a hyperplane which somehow uh, corresponds to classic functions with lower VT dimension? It turns out that something like this can be done by taking hyperplanes that lead to a large margin of separation between the classes. So we could take the hyperplane that induces the largest margin of separation so again, like before, we, uh, we do this in the feature space. We then know that it corresponds to something nonlinear in the input space if this mapping here is nonlinear, which it, for instance, is for a Gaussian kernel. And then uh, we again, like before, we get a solution which is the sign of a kernel expansion. So that was the same in the mean classifier. But in the mean classifier, it was a very simple kernel expansion where in the positive class, uh, all kernels had the weight one over the size of the class, and the negative class likewise with a minus. So here, this is a slightly more general form, and it turns out 
these coefficients here uh, are the solution of a quadratic optimization problem that's related to this margin maximization, and that maybe I will tell you about tomorrow. And uh, that's a support vector machine. And uh, you can uh, show a video. So this is now, now depending on how we choose this mapping phi, we get different solutions in the input space. So here it's always a hyperplane in the input space. It could be linear, could be nonlinear. So if phi is a linear mapping, this will also be linear on the input space. And here actually I have a version of the support vector machine, which also allows for some points to lie inside the margin, because this problem is not linearly uh, separable. But uh, if we now start turning on the nonlinearity, so we may, so I'm actually using a Gaussian kernel, I start with a very wide kernel, which is effectively like a linear kernel, and then I make it more and more narrow, the SVM solution, and then I get a more and more nonlinear separation of these two data sets. <laughs> if someone wants to write a book, we can do it, uh, type a page. Yeah. And, uh, and then you can, uh, so all these things correspond to uh, separating, correspond to separating hyperplanes uh, in some high dimensional space. And of course, uh, they could be very complicated objects. We can also, this is a, a variant of an SVM for uh, approximating 3D point clouds. So here, we also essentially have some modifications, so some multi-state algorithm, but essentially we have a hyperplane in a Hilbert space which corresponds to this relatively complex shape in the input space, or, or we can do other kinds of complex shapes in the input space. And I have another favorite example of a, of a I think Neil has seen this before, of a decision rule which becomes linear when you embed it in the right space. <laughs> I think this was photoshopped by, so <laughs> by someone in England. Um, so I think we have 10 minutes left, and I think it would be a good time actually to take some questions at this point. Before I, so I'm going to start uh, tomorrow, uh, continue with this uh, main classifier, and uh, tell you why I think it's actually quite in interesting. So far, it was just a thousand minutes analogy, but it's actually much more interesting than that. So we'll do that tomorrow. Uh, but maybe now we can have some discussion or questions. Thank you very much. Well, one can uh, one can give some uh, some uh, suggestions of the complexity of these function classes. Yeah, I think one could probably do something. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's a more advanced question. Simple questions are also uh, allowed. I prefer simple questions. So. <laughs> Someone has to ask the question, how do you choose the kernel? <laughs> Not you, no? Okay, we, 